Okay, it looks like we're live. All right, everybody, my name is Matt Carver with Bearwood Supply. I'm here today to either do a project with you or show you my methods for doing one. <clears throat> so, um, here we are, my tiny space. I live in Southern California and uh, time is, uh, area is pretty precious down here, so I'm doing all this in a one car garage. So, uh, my little space here. So, I'll drop you down a little bit. This is where I'll do the work for the most part, but let me just talk a bit more. So, today we're going to do a um, project that I thought might be helpful for everybody to learn a little bit about relief carving. And <clears throat> it's just a stack of books. So, this stack of books is, you know, my idea. It's like the word tomes, T-O-M-E-S. It's the really old sort that sit in a really old law library or in a uh, extravagant English home, that sort of uh, old book. So it's more of a tome than a book and probably never even gets read. So I made a miniature one not too long ago that <clears throat> just exemplifies what I wanted to go over today. So it's really quite small and it's uh, you know, it's just tiny, but the one I'm making today is not much larger. So let me drop you down and show some of the work I'll be doing here. So here's the pattern. I did send this pattern over to the wood carving for beginners group that's hosted by Bear Woods and included a bunch of relief written, uh, uh, basics. So uh, you don't need to follow all those basics uh, to do relief carving. I thought they might just be helpful. So <clears throat> what I did for the block is this is just kind of scrap for me. I buy quite a lot of lumber and I just, you know, this was some size and I just cut it from the most part to fit this piece of paper. This is basswood and a couple things about basswood it's really pretty easy it's a hardwood but it's pretty light it's really easy to carve i'm sure all of you know about basswood so a couple things that people have asked me in the past for example here's another piece of scrap so a lot of people wonder why sometimes i carve with the grain going vertical and sometimes i carve with the grain going horizontal. And for me, as long as my chisels are sharp, it's never been an issue. So, I mean, really, it's never been an issue because if your, your chisels are sharp, it should cut against the grain, no issue. So a lot of people like to just go horizontal so that they can keep, uh, you know, if, they're, if their project is face up here, they'll want to have it go horizontal so that um, everything matches the grain and most of your work is done with the grain. But in my opinion, for example, this project here is for someone's Christmas present. And this one here is all vertical. And this one, for example, <clears throat> this one is all horizontal. And for me, as long as the chisels are sharp, it's not an issue, number one. But two, um, uh, I don't ever have issues with the grain, but also in the beginning, I didn't have a whole lot of money to just spend on wood. So <clears throat> if I cut out a piece of, you know, wood and did it in one place or did it for one project, whatever what was left over kind of had to be used. So I didn't really, it didn't really bother me that it was going to go this way or go this way. So, <clears throat> pardon me, I'm getting over a cold here. <clears throat> so, today, tomes. I'm just going to go forward the way I normally do for any project. So, normally what I would do is I would take this and I would get some masking tape and I would attach it to the block that I'm using and basically put it in. Now, the thing I'd like to add here is that 
it's really important to have a place on the block that you know is kind of like at zero. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to put this far corner or this side and this side exactly to the edge. And I'll know that if I have to make measurements later, that I'll always be able to come to that edge and know that it's pretty much zero. So put my tape on there. Then, you know, when you're doing the work, <clears throat> you can always lift it up. Not when you're doing the work, when you're doing the transfer, you can lift it up and see how you're doing. Now, I don't use any carbon paper, as I've mentioned before. Um, again, in the beginning, there just wasn't enough money for me to be doing this. And you wonder how long I've done this. It's uh, been over 20 years. So I was a young pup, married, and uh, the wife didn't have a whole lot of allocation funds for my hobby. So I used everything and everything to its fullest. So from this point, what we're going to do is we're going to transfer by following all these lines and outlining it and then we're going to get an indent in the wood from this metal stylus along this tracing lines and it's going to go into the wood so let's do that here <coughs> If it doesn't come out just right, <clears throat> don't worry about it. It'll be fine. And on the straighter ways, you can use a ruler. For me, it's just easier to get that in there. And also, my phone is pretty far away from me, so I'll look in from time to time and say hi to you guys or answer any questions I can see. Ah, I got some people from, I think that's Australia and Chicago as well. Hi guys. <clears throat> All right, now I'm gonna just move it around a bit so I can get it in a better view. Now all these straight lines <clears throat> don't have to be crazy you're gonna do a lot of work on them so you know more or less straight I'll try to keep the piece in the right area. Sometimes I just move it all over and I don't pay attention to you, <clears throat> to where it is. And I'll try to do that to keep you guys in good view. See what we have here. <clears throat> Need some corners here. 
go back over here and do these. Looks like we have the set. So now we can pull this off and we can put this up in a place that you can see it. And for me, it's important to keep that because <clears throat> there's a point in time when you're doing the work that the lines, you know, these lines that we're going to draw in, they all just disappear. You've cut them away. You've cut a bunch of depths, you put, cut a bunch of angles, you just, they're gone. So you have to redraw them. And in some cases, on this particular one, it may not be as difficult to find, you know, the end of the book. But when you guys are doing your scenes of, you know, majest, uh, majestic scenes of whatever, you're going to have a bunch of different subject matter in there. You're going to have like a guy way over there and maybe like a horse and cart over here. And then, you know, you're going to have stuff everywhere. That's why this zero mark is so important because you'll be going, okay, well, you know, I need to know where this line sits. So you'll have to measure it from your zero line to get to there and go, okay, well, it's that far. And then you can just reset your, your point here and then start again. So you'll just need to be redrawing and remeasuring and so on. Sometimes it's important to just cut through here and then go, oh, you know what? I think I cut a little too much, so I'm going to have to make that deeper to get that back. And where's the end of the book? Oh, well, let's find out how far from the top it is, and then we'll go measure it back in again and then put on our mark. So it's important to keep this. And if you think you're going to cut through this, cut a few of these. I mean, print a few of these so that you have the exact size before you start your project. So, all right, let's go back in and do our outline. See how the pencil just flows right through that groove without an issue? And you don't have to be an artist to do this stuff. <clears throat> For years and years and years, um, I didn't know anything. And then I took a few private lessons to learn how to draw, which really didn't amount to much, to tell the truth. So, I mean, I'm a, I'm a decent carver, I guess, but, you know, I, I'm not an artist. So there's so many ways to get your artwork. You can pay an artist. Or you can get royalty-free art. You can go take a picture yourself and then print it out on a document. I mean, it's really, the world is open to you if you, you can put it on paper. All right, there we are. So <clears throat> let me look up here. 
<laughs> well, this is a new cup of pencils, Bill. So, you know, most of the other ones are on the ground somewhere and I had to go buy new ones. <laughs> All right, so so the metal stylus, my best friend. So you don't need such a fancy one. There are tons of them in the marketplace. And so, you know, really just find one that works for you, ballpoint on the tip. And because we're using basswood, it really makes a great indentation without any real issue. So if you're going to do walnut or something, I have done it with walnut, but my finger hurt after. So, you know, or birch, birch, birch was tougher, but it did still work. So, you know, you can always just go ahead and, you know, uh, settle on buying carbon paper too, if you like. Um, either way, I, I haven't used carbon paper in years. So let's look at the project. So let me put this so you guys can see it. So this is a bigger piece of wood than this one. So I can't do exactly what I did on this, but for all intents and purposes, it really will be exactly what this was, except for the fact that some lines will be longer and some parts of this will be bigger. But what you can do is, you know, for example, when I do a really big piece of work, huge thing, I'll do the entire size large print and then i'll outline it just the same way and then i'll go back and put all the lines in but the piece of paper that i use as reference is this big so it's really just what your mind's eye needs to see to do the work it doesn't have to be another giant print so, but you keep the print because you want to be able to measure later so what we did here to start is <clears throat> We ha what we have to do here to start is we have to make some room to work. So we have to create some depth for us to get our mind's eye in the game. So what we're going to do to get that going is we're going to outline this top portion here. From this line here all the way around to here. And then up this line and down this line. So this upper half. We're going to make some depth so that we have some 3D and some work to some area to work with. Okay, so let's do that. Again, sorry, I'm using the straight chisel. Uh, pardon me, a straight skew. It's a 1S 8 millimeter. This is what comes with my, um, I think it was the 12 piece uh, shaft tool set. You don't have to make crazy deep lines. Don't hurt your hand. Don't mess up your work. Just get the cut in there. And you'll see that I'm going to try to simplify things as well. From here, I'm going to just cut a straight line not touching my lines here. Same here. And then I just cut a straight line just to the outside of my outlined lines. All right, now we have a cut area. So what we're gonna do is create some area to work. I'm gonna use a largest chisel uh, for this tiny block. It's gonna be a number five, eight millimeter. It's really just about the millimeter on the corner to corner. I want something that's not so large, <clears throat> you know, that it's going to damage and be easy to slip, but something large enough that I can just get in there and uh, see what I'm cutting. Preliminary cuts like this really just want to get your bearings.
And yes, you can go in here and use a V parting tool if you'd like. Um, it's just not my way. So if that's your way, go for it. Just want a little bit of warm up as I'm going into my work. As you get to more important parts, then you go in and cut more cleanly. All right, so now you can see that I've got an area around this and I know that needs to be cut away. So with this like this, <clears throat> it's still not enough material here for me to go in and start making, you know, changes. So I'm going to cut a large part of this out. We'll use a larger fishtail just because it's got the wings. Try to keep you guys in view. Sometimes I just go crazy and I don't remember who's watching. Sorry about that. One of my preferred methods of cutting is like this. So it limits any, any possibility of me getting hurt. I've got pressure from one hand and the holding hand, the dominant hand just grips the tool. So I do a lot of work like this because it can only go like two inches tops, not even that far, and it still gets to cut. So, but you guys can't see very well, so I gotta remember not to do that. Now we're gonna take our V parting and just cut part of that out. It's just so part of me. Sorry about that. Front. Front. I don't understand what that means. The front of what you've seen. If this is a problem, I'm not you're not seeing what you need to, let me know. I'll change the place of the camera. Really? Are other people having problems as well? I can move the placement of the camera. Let me try that. Okay, let me move the camera and see if that's any better.
Is that any better? Maybe that's better. <laughs> All right, I'm going to continue. You guys just tell me if that's any better. Should be a little closer. Okay, I'm just going to keep going then. So normally I would recommend that you guys not hack off so much material so quickly. It dulls the tool and um, it's not terribly unsafe, but it's not terribly safe either. So, you know, just go at your carving like you enjoy it, which is what you're supposed to do. For me, I'm trying to get to a point where you guys can learn something. <clears throat> or at least enjoy something about the carving and not just sitting here watching me hack away bulk material. I'm going to move a block into place so that I can hack some of this off. So we're almost there.
so now we have more or less what we need. So we have enough area to work. Let me clean it up a bit and then we can start something else. You can never find the tool that you want. As you can see, this is really just clean, cleaning so that I can get to the actual carving. Yes, basswood. Sorry, with my phone pointed down like that, I have to duck so that I can see what you're saying. Yes, and feel free to answer any questions that are coming your way, guys. And girls. All right. Not pretty, but it does give us some area to work. So now, at this stage, we want to try to put in a little bit of 3D. So what we're going to do to get in that 3D is look at it. Now, we see a stack of books, and your mind knows it's a stack of books. And it's obviously a stack of books. But making your first actual cuts can be a little... Um, you know, confusing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, look at an easy, the easiest spot to make some 3D movement. <clears throat> and that will be right here. Do you see this bottom book here? It's larger than all the rest of the books. And these books sit on top of it, offering a little bit of 3D view from this edge. So what we're going to do is we're going to cut along the upper edge, the upper book's edge. And when we do that, we can get some removal. So we can start to move the cut inward along that edge. Now, what's the angle of cut? Doesn't really matter at the moment. Technically, this line here, it goes from right here to behind these books continues to go on forever, right? So we could take this <clears throat> angle right here all the way to the back if you'd like. But we really just want a little bit of definition. So we're going to cut some definition. Okay, so we currently have a little bit of definition. So we're going to do the exact same thing with this edge. So this is the table. These are the books. You would see that the table goes on beyond the books. So we're now going to cut that in. Now 
I'm only going to take this cut to the edge of the table. And then we'll cut that one in now. So at this stage, we don't need to take out this whole corner here and make it all clean, but sometimes it helps the mind's eye to see, to see things. All right, all right, let's look at um, the other side of the table. So over here, we have, you know, a line as well. So we'll, you see here, these areas here, we don't need to worry about this at the moment. You can at any time go in there and get them all clean, it's no problem. But right now, it's not as important. So I can see a tiny area between here and the top of the cut that we know sits behind these books. So we're just gonna cut that in. Not much, right? But it's enough to give us a bit of definition. It happens all the time, a little too much. And now we have to cut in the books. <clears throat> Again, start from the corner and go to its edge. And now that we have that line cut to our corner, we can cut off this side of the wood. It happens all the time. to use a Now, you can see here, I'm going to cut a little bit more, but you can see here that I have this edge. I don't have any idea what this angle is, but you can see that there's a bit of wood in here. So, what we can do now is we can cut, we can cut the side of the books. And we can cut it, you know, you can cut it as much as you'd like. You know that it has to drop at least down to here, but 
much further likely. So you can cut it, keep cutting if you like. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut only, I'm going to cut this area here only as much as I've cut here. Okay? Let's go back in and get a little more depth. You note that I'm taking less off here than I am here. So my cuts start very light and get heavier as I get to this edge. off this area. Remember, I'm only going to do it from my line. So, from here. Okay, looks a little more 3D. At this stage, are there any questions that I can help you with? You guys think about that and I'll continue and continue looking back. So I'm going to just do a little cleanup so that I can see my own work a little better. relief carving it's always a little more depth a little more depth it's pretty much a mantra that you'll live by by doing this kind of work when you're doing a handheld carvings you know, with a block like this uh, it's easier to just go where do I need to do my next work but with relief carving you have to take off bulk material so that you can even get to your work and that's what you often do I think I mentioned um, in my written notes <clears throat> or my written lessons that 
the skew is often used in lieu of the parting tool. And I do it often. Uh, the parting tool certainly is helpful. Um, but if you're like any carver, um, these guys get dull fairly quickly and you have to sharpen them. And I honestly don't know any carver that likes sharpening these. We can do it. We do do it. <laughs> but nobody likes doing it. So when it gets dull, we tend to find the next best tool and we get really good at it, which is in many cases the skew. <clears throat> now, this doesn't have to be you guys, but I often work with depths that are far, far larger than this. This is a one inch block, uh, one inch thick, but um, I tend to go get a whole bunch of depth so that I can do more of the carving part, which is the fun part. And so in many cases, I could probably just make this carving work with the depth that I've got. Uh, it's just habit for me from so many years. and. I'll try to stop myself from digging deeper when <laughs> I really don't think I need to. More depth is more shadow and so on. It's always shooting through my mind, I'm thinking. <laughs> All right, so now we got some depth <clears throat> and we have some 3D. We can clean this edge up and make it a little flatter, but this entire area will go away at some point. So as long as we can see what we need to see, you can see that it's uh, it's got its edge here, which we can always make more, and it's got its 3D here and here that we can always make more as well. So let's go ahead and cut in these lines. Again, when you're cutting these lines, don't worry. If it line goes off, you're like, oh, that's not right. Oh, what am I going to do? You know what? There's always a way to fix it. I heard from a friend of mine that said, the sign of a true master is the guy that can fix his own mistakes and no one ever knew about it. So, honestly, things happen. And you're going to encounter problems all all the time and it's not enough of a problem for you to scrap your work it just isn't it's called a design change and yes I have had design changes so you see that I'm cutting straight down here it's because there's so much more work to do but once I get to here I can't cut down I can't cut straight down here because I've already set an angle to this side, uh, this top of the book. So when I get to here, I have to turn to match that angle. Do you see? All right. Now we're going to have to redraw these lines. So what I do in most cases where I don't understand the perspective well enough to just draw them in. I mean, an artist would just go, okay, well, this line's going in this angle, so it has to go here. I'm not that good, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back, and I'm going to get my work again, and I'm going to get my stylus, and I'm going to put this down where I believe it needs to be to get those back in place. I believe is about right there. So now when I do this, I can use the stylus to, and you don't need to go crazy. It doesn't have to be perfect. And it's going to be written. It's going to be indented on, you know, wood that's been carved. So it's not going to be a straight line or anything, but it will give you a really good understanding of where the line 
more or less needs to be. And you can probably already see me cutting right through this paper with the stylus. Yep, it happens. I did a carving once that sold almost immediately. And then there were three other people that said, I need one of those. I'm like, cool. And then I went back and I used the same paper like three times. And it was literally, I could just put the stylus right through the paper and draw right through the paper after that. And then I realized after a while that I could just go print another one. All right. So now we should have good. See, I don't know if you can see this. I'll try to give you some clarity here. You probably should be able to see these lines up here. Now they're not perfect, no. They're just not gonna be perfect. Uh-oh. Sorry, I'm trying to get you clearer view. Okay, so they're not gonna be perfect, but they are good enough. Get a smaller ruler. one right here and an extra one right here and here and up here okay so now what we can do here is we can cut in these separation lines for the books themselves so something to remember is that we have the top of the book and then we have the top of the inside cover so we have to remember that there's going to be another set of lines there like that right so we have the top of the book which is kind of the bottom of this book so we're not going to go crazy about that so maybe three lines per section should be fine and if it isn't, we'll look at it at that time because we're not going to go crazy about this. So now we're just going to go ahead and cut that third line. We will again use the skew. And normally I do it like this, but I do understand it's tough to see it when I do that. Sorry. So we'll just go from our corner down that line. Again, if it's not perfect, it's okay. So, one of the things that I thought about when I first did this piece, when I did the smaller one, um, this one was that um, I didn't like how uniform these line these books were these books were placed uh, they appear to be placed like a librarian where they are perfectly in order and they sit you know from the smallest to largest in a perfect perfect way um, and I wanted more like randomly placed. So then I cut in all the books and then I made each um, binding stick out or push back from each other to make it more normal looking. So that's what you can do here or you can opt out and not do it that way. 
it's completely up to you since it's your carving. So now that we have cut here, let me look at this again. Yes, so what I would like to do is um, make these lines a little bit deeper all the way up and down. And what that will do for me is it will allow me to cut this again. And you'll see that I do a lot of repeat work. <clears throat> it's not abnormal for me. Yeah. Okay. 25 millimeters. Okay. <laughs> I didn't know what that is in inches. It's all inches in my shop. <laughs> so I do a lot of repeat work, but I never found that to be an issue for me because it just um, sets it in my head deeper and clearer for me. So I'm going to make these deeper, like I said. And what that's going to do is it's going to allow me to see these lines even after I cut this entire section down again to the back of this area. And it will make it easier for me not to have to place the pattern back on here again. And repeat work, uh, like I said, if it bothers you to repeat work, then, you know, I suppose you can try to get it right the first time, but it's never been my um, ability to do that. So repeating is pretty common in relief carving. You get a little depth off, you cut what you can, you get a little more depth off, and you go back and you cut again. So it's kind of a constant effort with relief carving. But again, uh, I don't have any issue with it. I'm going to cut this again here. So I can get a little more depth out of that. All right. Some more depth. So the way I hold the chisel is allowing me to take off um, just swaths of material that don't go very far. You see, I can I really only go from here to here and the tool won't go any further. So it allows me to do very quick cuts because I know that the tool can't go very far. So now I'm going to cut these books. I prefer long handled tools. Long handled tools are um, they fall into the full size chisel bracket, and I think a short handled chisel uh, falls into a basic chisel set, which is a D tool in some brands, which are beginner or intermediate tool sets. And then there are the palm tools. So for me, the long handle ones are full size, and every chisel I own is a full size. However, I do have some smaller ones that people have gifted me over the years that I don't really use.
Mm, there was one comment at the top that I can't read anymore about removing wood. Maybe you could repeat that. So a lot of the relief carving, or rather maybe it's just my method, that I tend to do is I look at need. And what I mean by that is I'll look at the work and I'll go, what do I want to do next or what do I need to do next? And I'll go, okay, well, I guess I'll take off this book here or this edge here and push it back even further. Okay, what do I have to do in order to do that? Well, if I don't want to have to bring back my pattern again, I better make this line again here. So you do that, and then you can cut again. So I do that pretty much with all my work. And in most cases, it's not as simple as getting a line in there. It's, you know, because you did that, before you can do that, you have to go work on this other area. And that's a lot of the same thing, but in different ways. Okay, so I intend to bring all of these guys down to here, to this left where the depth currently is now. And that depth will um, exemplify the, the book's distance for me. And then after I get those books to this current level here, I'm going to then start to work on the front part of it. But I will also determine if these books are going to stick out like these or just be flat. But even if they're flat, that means that the backside would not match. But it's hard to tell that from the backside and you want it to be clear. So that's why these books stick out on the front. So even though say for example this book is obviously shorter and smaller than this book with relief carving it's all subterfuge so it kind of looks like it goes to the exact same area as this one does but we know it's much smaller than this one again relief carving subterfuge illusion Have this line here still. I can still see my line starting here and around here somewhere. So as long as I'm willing to meet them at the end, I still have my line. So you can see that I've cut from here to here. And actually it's interesting because this was bound to happen. 
Can you see? Sorry, guys. I don't know what happened there. Um, I've never once had problems with wireless in my garage. So, what I was saying is that... Um, right. So, this was the original spot where this line ended. So, as you cut away you tend to pick more up, more wood up, more area. So I have to bring that back. See how I've gained wood here? So now we just need to cut it away. That's where we started. That's where we need to be. Can you see that, guys? <laughs> no, I don't feel bad about the sharpening of the V tool. Everybody hates that tool. Everybody needs it, but everybody hates it. Is everybody still there? I had a small problem with wireless a minute ago. And yeah, I guess so. I mean, <laughs> I've done lots of slicing cuts with the skew before. Um, you mean like up here or here or here, correct? I've, I've never not used it for that reason. And maybe it's basswood? Basswood is particularly easy to slice with a um, with a skew. All right, so now I'm going to have to go clean this up over here. We didn't do that earlier, and now it needs it. So I'm going to cut down into the corner. You can see that I'm going to cut into this corner, all these little corners here, so that I can get in there and remove the wood that we know doesn't need to be there. Don't go past your line though. Ah! Yes, you mean like over here, when I do this. I've always loved the skew for that reason. Now, my skews, all of my skews have a double edge. I wonder if you can see that. So the double edge allows for cuts on either side. So all I really need to do is make sure, just like when you're sharpening it, that it's flat. And once it's flat, you can get a very, very clean, even better than sandpaper clean um, slice. So I do very much uh, like that. Okay, back to this one over here.
So you have to be very careful when you're cutting with the, the grain. If you're not careful about that, um, you'll accidentally split the wood. So when you're cutting in this direction, you gotta be very careful that you don't take too much or too deep of a cut. See how it's so easy for this to part right here? Yeah, so much of my work is done with the skew. It's such a versatile tool. Okay, that's more or less clean. Just going to clean this edge up a little bit again. Okay, so at this stage, what we can do is we can start to separate the books. West Virginia, that's far away, at least for me. I tend to think that everybody that watches is from the East Coast. <laughs> okay, so to separate these books, first of all, I'm going to clean up these edges slightly. And I'm going to do that with a straight chisel. And, we're going to and it's also a double-edged, like my skew. And when I straighten these guys, I'm just going to try to remove some of the rounded parts of the flat sides that I was supposed to get clean and clear. And these are pretty good. And one of the things that you can see right now is that it's kind of rounded right here. You can see it's rounded up and over. It's kind of got rounded section here. But one of the things that's going to occur after we set the books is that <clears throat> we're going to have to redraw these inside flaps to the book covers back and front. And when we do that, <clears throat> we're going to need to cut a fairly good section of it out. So with these tomes, you have this outside cover and then the book is on the inside and there's a fairly good distance between um, the pages and the outer cover. So we're going to cut um, sections of that like this on all of these edges to show <clears throat> that outside cover. And once we get that outside cover shown, we're going to cut it in. You see how that looks? So it has the actual outside cover. We drop down the middle sections and then turn those into pages. But first of all, let's cut in these books. So number one, we're going to just round these edges. So we start by rounding. Again, you could use your V parting tool, but depending on which kind of V parting tool you have, it may make it too much, uh, it may cut too much off of these edges. And my tool is probably okay, but <clears throat> if I can use a tool that everybody's bound to have to do the work, I prefer to do that because everybody's got that tool. If I use a V parting tool and you go home and use this giant v, you know, parting tool that you have and it's not the one I have, 
it's I was not a helpful teacher. So by doing it this way, we should be good to go. Okay. <clears throat> now we got to do the other side. So we're going to flip it around. Now, it was really easy to cut this way. So we have to be careful that maybe the grain doesn't work that way. So we have to be careful to see if it's also easy. Luckily, my tool is very sharp. So it seems to be okay. Just be, you know, be attentive in your work. You go, oh, it was really easy. The grain's going the same direction. No problem. And then all of a sudden you cut off something that snaps free a big piece of wood that you really needed. So just be cognizant that it may not work the same way it did on the other side. See, I'm running into that right now. This is more than I want to cut off. So what I'm going to do is go back the other way. And I'm going to cut it off from this side. You see that? we got this flap here, <clears throat> which is not insurmountable. But it is <clears throat> larger than I wanted at this present time. However, it's not a big problem. So I'm going to just cut a little dip deeper here and get rid of that. I also caught it before it got too big. So just, you know, be careful. Okay, so because you have a one inch block, you can go as deep as you like. Now, I could go deeper, but we know that takes time. So we're gonna do the work right here. That said, I still want these books to be less uniform. So what I'm going to do is randomly choose. And you can do the same thing. You don't have to follow a pattern exactly as you see it, as long as you know what to do with it. So what I'm gonna do is, I'm going to keep this guy exactly where it is. And the reason for that is because uh, it's touching the table and the other ones aren't. So I'm just going to randomly choose to push some of these books away. So I'm going to push this one away. And when I push this one away, I want to try to follow the angle that we have set here. So that angle can change. A little bit but not terribly much okay so with that cut there everything above this angle can kind of be played with and I'm going to now cut the line just above that guy and I'll just go straight down on that one Okay, now that I've done that, what that allows me to do is to put this, this book angle in a completely different place. So I'm going to go down to the bottom part and cut away. You know that we cut this deeper here. So I can cut this at least as far as that depth went. Less if you'd like. And the reason you can cut less is because you know that there's always going to be space between each book and each book's edge is rounded so we can always round those edges and if you want to paint it you can always shove a little black in there for shadow and if it just goes deeper than you want it to it's not going to be a problem remember subterfuge that's relief carving now that I got some depth on that one edge there, I'm going to cut this one up here. And 
your mind is always pulled to what you think there is a problem with. And I keep seeing this as a problem down here. That's why I can't keep my chisel away from it. Okay, so now I'm going to try to work in between these areas. And in order to work in between these areas, I'm going to need to use a different tool than the skew because that sharp edge is really going to damage these areas if it gets in there. So I'm going to use this tool, which is a number seven at six millimeters. And like I said before, it's really a matter of how large it is corner to corner. That's going to be my choosing focus for the chisel used on this work. So I'm going to cut parts of this away. And when I cut this away, I'm going to be careful not to cut this book. And if I get into a position where I think I might, I'm going to stretch my line out a little bit more. Okay. All right, and you don't have to go crazy with this, and especially since we don't want to cut off any more depth today. Okay, so that's fine. So now what we want to do is take all of this area from this depth to this height and make it flat. So we will do that now. try to do this so you can see it I apologize so first we'll take it off at the hump right here and slowly draw back keeping it flat just continue to pull off the hump Ah, we got another Californian, Sacramento. Sweet. Apparently, the East Coast is going through a hella storm right now, I guess. That's what I heard. Alright, so the only hump is about here-ish. So I'm just going to try to remove that and clean it as best I can. Alright, for the most part that's good. Now, I want to make sure that we determine the proper line over here. Now, I'm going to look at that straight ahead. So we have to look at the books in a typical way. So if this book and this angle is correct, then this book and <clears throat> its angle means that this edge is closer to us. So that means that these, this one, I mean, we haven't determined what these are yet, but we recognize that if this is, this edge is closer to us, then this one must be farther away from us. So this one would have to drop down further. Does that make sense? And if it doesn't, you know, grab four or five books, throw it on the table and try it out yourself. I often make props of my own to determine um, the complexity of perspective. So you're not cheating and you're not dumb either. So um, sometimes it's so incredibly difficult to figure out what specific angles are um, in relief carving because you started here, right guys? When you start here, you're like, oh yeah, it's super simple to see because your print is on there and it all makes perfect sense. 
And then you cut away 90% of your lines and you're like, oh my God, I don't see the path forward. And it's very, very normal. So set yourself up a prop and that helps a lot. All right, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna push this top book away as well. So as we've discussed before, we're going to keep trying to get you in focus. Okay, we're going to start low here and, uh, pardon me, high here and cut deeper here. And then we're going to cut it away. We're kind of coming high on this side rather than the top, so I'm going to cut a bit more. I'm going to use the skew to just remove some of that thickness there. Okay, now I don't want anything in here to just line up. So I think what I'm gonna do is I'm going to push this one back and then I'm gonna push this one back a little bit. Okay, so again, high here and lower toward the end. And this one is half as strong. And then we cut it away. And this one, just half as much. You can reset your lines at any time to cut more away from one or the other. And I did on the first one as well. Now, you can go back here and redo this again. Later, what I might do is uh, continue this lesson and we can do whatever portion we didn't finish today um, in the future. Um, but it's really, you know, up to you where you want to put these books. And uh, this doesn't match this one. So... That's great. For me, it's great because the challenge is what I need to continue moving forward. There's no challenge. It's really hard for me to complete carvings when I have to repeat carvings or, you know, sometimes you have no choice, you know. Somebody asks for something and then somebody else sees it and they want the same thing and you're like, cool, I mean, the sales are nice, but I really don't want to redo it. <laughs> but you don't really have a choice. So, uh, some randomness is helpful in all of your work. Okay, that's very clean there. And this one's clean. Very nice. Okay, so now we need to determine how we want these to look. So, let me look at this. All right, 
this one's easiest to do. So let's push, let's push this one further down a little bit. And now we'll use a wide chisel to push it away. Cool. So what we did here was we pushed this lip just underneath this book. And it's not really much, but it's enough. And by the time the completed piece is done, it will be clearly and very noticeable. And we can certainly keep pushing more into it. And I don't have a problem with that. But we can see now that this goes underneath this book. And this one is higher. And these two are higher as well. And we can push the same thing there. So this one and this one are the same uh, angle. So we need to push this one under as well. So you can see that once we start to push these angles away from each other, um, it becomes far more 3D. Yep. Yeah. All right, now I'm going to attack the newest area, or the oldest area, I should say, pardon me. And that would be to separate these books from this table. So we're going to cut, first of all, we're going to line this part of the table up with the angle that we know the books are sitting at. So we have to clean that up. And sometimes it's easier to cut against the grain just to get your angle correct, which I do from time to time. Now, we're, at this point, we're going to be affecting the angles of the books uh, because everything we start with is flat.
and dropping to just you know below an eighth of an inch around here is not enough to get this table to look flat so we are going to have to cut this book out and then we will cut it free of the table and then you can see once we cut it free of the table how much more of an angle we have to cut so certainly we could leave this whole area flat and then maybe use um, pyrography or other art um, methods to draw in the table but what I would like to do is show you how we can put the table and the books together and also um, texture the wood of the table. So we have to cut that free and we have to do it to an extent at which most of the, at least most of this area here is flat. I mean angled. We're going to make it flat, but we're going to put it at an angle that matches more or less what's up here. So by making these shortcuts that I'm doing, it allows me to use my non-dominant hand to put pressure on the tool in a non-cutting area that really stabilizes it very very well and very safely so once you get used to that method it becomes second nature and I haven't been cut carving in many many years I know it seems hard to imagine but I cut myself when I move tools aside and I cut myself on different power tools and stupid things like that. Just me being dumb. But I haven't cut myself carving in so many years. It's I, no, I can't remember it last time. I do remember doing it a lot in the beginning. You're going to need to t put in more depth from time to time when you cut in more depth on the front here. And that's just this just a fact. This is why I say that relief carving is just a lot of repetition. You cut one section out and you're like, eh, I gotta go back and do more depth just so I can get some more area to work on. So Technically, you could, you know, make an angle that looks like this. You can go from here and say, okay, well, why don't I just cut off only this much? Why don't I just cut off this much and make this a super steep angle here? And it's a good idea. And a lot of people don't want to just continue hacking off depth to get to a low relief of what they wanted would do just that. Except that... With this pattern, we are forced into a specific angle based on this little triangle right here. <clears throat> if this were higher, you know, we could do that angle here. But it is fairly low here, so we don't really have a choice. And that means that <clears throat> this angle has to go further back.
I'm going to go ahead and cut a little bit of that table free. And the object is to take what you're cutting here and join it into the angle here. So we'll do some of that. And by, by lessening or strengthening the amount of pressure that you put with your non-dominant hand, you can maneuver the chisel to pull off more or less. And then just the repetitive movement here is what you have to get used to. to. Pull off a bunch of material or just a little bit of material. And now we're on the other side now too. Now that we've cut in front of the book, we're carrying that angle all the way through to the other side. Ohio, Texas. Lots of Texas guys. I've had a lot of guys follow me from Texas before. You guys do a lot of carving in Texas? Another Ohio and another Florida. You guys are from all over. If you guys have any questions, I'd be happy to help you with that. You know, you guys, I got to sharpen one of these tools. You want to see that? Let me know. Okay, let me move into position. Okay, hang on guys, it's going to be like some movement here. Hope that doesn't make anybody sick. 
Can you guys see the buffing wheel? All right, so here's the bandsaw. Here's the bandsaw. I don't need to do that because the tool only needs to be honed. But let me see if I can get you even closer than normal. Not sure that I can get you any closer, but I'll try. No, that's as far as we're going to get you in there. Okay, so <clears throat> I use a buffing wheel in order to sharpen. So you guys are going to see that. This is a fishtail three. It's a number three fishtail at 12 millimeters. Now, when I start this, it's going to be a little loud. Sorry. And I'm going to use <laughs> this little piece of bonding, uh, pardon me, of abrasive. And then I'm going to do the movement. And it looks like that one's done. I don't know if I'm done sharpening yet. I just wanted to look and make sure you guys hadn't, didn't have any questions. All right, so there it is. Yeah, may not get as clear as picture as I'd like for you guys let's check this here see if we got anything better yeah it's better yes better we're gonna go do you have any questions while I'm still in the at this station technically all I did was hone the tool didn't need to sharpen it just hone all right back to here so we're going to cut this deeper again right here And we're going to give ourselves a little more angle. That cuts so much better.
Okay, so at this stage, I think I'm going to call it and say that this is, for now, it's as flat as this desk is going to get, or the table. So I can come back at any time and continue to cut from here up to this line, and from here up to this line, and again from here over to this line. So these, this is our measuring barrier here. This whole line with this line. That whole section has to be one angle and it has to match each other all throughout. And then after that's all set, then you can set your books. Now, currently we have approximately, you know, this area that is sitting on that angle that we need and obviously it's not completely clean because you can see how bad it is but every time I look at it and I run over here and I start cutting again you can see that I see that it's wrong as well and I just go in automatically to try to clean it up but it, uh, it kind of takes away from the lesson if I just sit here and clean this thing. So what I'd like to do now is to show you that now you have this table at this angle and you can certainly clean it later but then you have this book sticking out and you're like well how am I gonna deal with it? Oh wait hang on get the question. Yes um that's a uh, chair? Oh, no Olga at, uh, Olga, Olga asks a question that says, basically, are you going to keep this angle? I mean, basically, it's the same flat edge as the original um, piece. So, technically, for me, what I would do is I would take this whole section from this corner and this corner and all along this edge, and I would bring it on one angle all the way to this line. That necessitates that I cut a lot deeper in here and a lot deeper over here. And right now, I don't want to cut that and just spend a bunch of time cutting while you guys are bored. So what I'm going to do is just leave it at this. This is the same angle at which I would normally cut. So technically, at this stage, we're going to leave it, but I would cut this, basically. I would cut from that corner to my current depth. Do you see that? So I would cut all of that off. And it would be all one flat angle. This book would stick out a ton at that point. But this book always needed to be cut anyway. So we're going to do that now. But to answer your question, that would be cut. <clears throat> I'm going to try to clean this section up here a little bit. It's kind of ugly and it doesn't really represent the pretty angle that I want it to be when you look at it. So right here, this angle has been uh, cut many times, but it's not correct to the artwork. The artwork shows that it goes from its book corner pretty far in. Now let's look at the concept of redrawing. So we know that this book here this book here is a specific size and I'm going to measure it with my forefinger and the pencil lead. So I just put my forefinger in there and determine up to this point how big it is. 
and it matches. So if this and this are correct, then what I can determine is how far down from the top of that second book to this line it is. And I can determine that it goes to approximately here. So if it goes to here, when you're looking at it flat, then I know that my line needs to change. So from corner to corner, right? Now, now when I look at it, do you see how much needs to be cut free? This whole area here needs to be cut free. And since this is all bad, or rather not useful, I can cut it. it they, they're bound to get larger, just like this area over here. As you cut, things just get bigger. And then you have to bring it back to the original pattern. So I'm going to cut that free. Now, I don't really need to cut it free. I just need to make it appear to be cut away. And I can go back later and actually cut it away. So now when we look at it, minus this junk in here, now when we look at it, the angle is much more correct. So now, with this table cut away, and I just keep seeing it incorrect, before I cut any of the things that are most important, the most important subject matter in a carving, I make everything around it perfect. So I'm not doing that today, so it's kind of weighing heavy on my brain. So... Okay, so we're gonna call that flat. Because even if we go back in here and make it deeper later, um, it's not going to be of detriment. So now what we can do is, we know that we can remove distance from here to here, which is a pretty low angle. And here. So we can remove between those pencil lines. Now, we do know that we must remove it from here. So let's try that. Now we can get our V party tool again and round it in. This is where the V party tool becomes super, super helpful because of its 45 degree angle. I think that's 45. So the 45 sits between, you know, right on the surface of this table and the book. So that's really helpful. Now we're going to cut some of this free up here, high, low.
Okay, so now we've joined the books back to the surface of the table. We know that we can cut the table at another day, which would necessitate that we cut the book again. Now, at this stage, we would normally clean it all up, but we don't have the time. So, basically, we would cut depth here, all around here again, and go deeper. We have a lot of material. We have about a half an inch. We've only used, up to this point, a half an inch of the entire depth of the block. So, we'd go back and make more depth, cut this away, and clean it. And then we'd have more depth here and here to play with. Technically, over here, we don't care as much. Certainly, we want to clean. We want to add pages and do all sorts of things. But when I was creating the other one, you can see that I really only worked on what you can see when you're directly looking at it. I didn't do any work over here at all because this is what you see. So when you're doing this, certainly you can go in there and do that. And I recommend that when you're creating something for a customer, you know, most customers will look at all sides of what they purchase. So it's important for you to do all sides. But for something that's only 2D, yeah, not as important. Okay, so... Have I answered any of the questions that you guys needed today? I think I may have, <clears throat> have demonstrated what I mainly wanted to get to. But I really want to answer your questions if you've got them. Because at this point, I'm just repeating things that you've already seen. No problem, man. We'll do it again. I um, I can always jump in here and do a video if you guys want one. Just, you know, in the group, just say, hey, would you do this? Or you can text me or, or pardon me, you can instant message me or uh, whatever. Find a way to contact me and say, hey, could you do one of these? I was trying to do one of these. But I couldn't make it work, whatever. Can you sharpen the tool closer? Can you... Whatever you need. I'm happy to help with the um, wood carving group. I mean, honestly, Bear has been so helpful. Um, Bear Wood Supply is a sponsor of the wood carving for beginners group. And they do a lot in there. I mean, they pr provide a lot of instruction. And they do a lot of contests and stuff like that. And they keep people engaged. It's more than I've ever seen in any other group. So... You know, I'd be happy to do it for them. Let me know if I can help you any further. I'm just going to sit here and carve. And if you guys want to ask questions, you can. If you want to watch. I mean, I'm just repeating stuff that you guys already know now. That's great, Dan. I'm glad to hear that. Hey, Bob, I'm using basswood. This is um, pretty typical for wood carving. Um, a lot of people say it's just used by beginners. I've been at this for 25 years, and I'm still using it. So, um, 
I can buy more expensive wood, but there's no reason for me to buy more expensive wood because basswood is still working for me just fine. I get everything I need from basswood. Besides, there's a lot of it where I live. Or rather, it may not even be where I live, but it's very accessible from where I live. Um, I'm not certain that it will be on YouTube, but it I know it will be on the uh, Facebook um, uh, uh, Bear Woods um, page. So maybe they're going to put it up. You can ask them. Okay, finally getting some of that depth taken care of. Just left it alone for so long that it bothers me. And it's cleaner to look at. Yeah. I think it's just a preference thing. People go a little crazy when they don't follow their normal method of doing things. You know, I really love this tool. This tool is a is a is a fish tail, and I got a bunch of these. And like for example, this tool and this tool, they're great for different things. This guy is so burly and so powerful that I could probably hit it with a mallet all day long and it won't be a problem. And this one, I could probably hit it with a mallet all day long too, but it is thinner and it flares to the edge. These flares are so super great because I can take off a swath of material from the center of the tool or I can take a swath of material off and then lightly or slightly move it to its right or left and take off the entire small edge in here. I love these tools. These are fantastic. And Schaff has done a really good job with them too. They are very sharp though. So one, one of the key points with sharp tools is that if you start cutting in an area you shouldn't be cutting, uh, it will stop and it will it will stop right on the area that you're cutting. Duh. I'm such a fool. There, there, there. Stay in your lane. Cool. That's nice. Let's 
So one small area right here. Then I can get back to work again. Um, John asked a good question. Warping of material. Well, I have seen it, yes. Um, here's an example. So, this is a piece that I'm doing for someone else. You can tell that the thickness here is still pretty large. It's like a quarter of an inch or so. Um all sides so i have brought i have brought the pieces down to something super tiny like you know almost almost paper thin so maybe a sixteenth of an inch i've i've done things down to pretty low before and when you get to that level it really does uh thin the woods being so thin will match what's going on in the rest of the piece so if there's a lot of wood here, likely, even if it's that thin, nothing will happen to it. But if the rest of the carving is also super thin and there's no super strong area or there's one strong area, that one strong area will determine how the entire piece warps. So maybe that's really, really big here and it's pulling. It might warp the whole thing in. It might spread it out. Yeah, you have to be careful, but not so careful that you, you know, have to worry about it. You got to bring it down super thin to get a problem with warp, warping on basswood. Now, it doesn't mean you should be leaving basswood outside, though. If you, you know, if you let the elements at it, it'll warp like right away, probably. stage if I were doing it for myself which at this stage I am um, I would go deeper following my line here could bring this depth even lower. Ooh. 
So now my depth could go from there to there. So you have to go around the book, obviously. Ah, um, sealing and finishing. Well, sealing and finishing for me are the same thing. Um, so I use this. So this guy is basically polyurethane. And it's in a spray can just to make it easier. And then, you know, you use a foam brush to spread it around and wipe off excess and so on. I spray it, I don't know, anywhere from twice to three times generally. And that would be for my walnut frames in addition to whatever carving I'm doing as well. <clears throat> so, yeah, it, it's pretty much all, all one thing for me. You throw this on there and you call it a day. Uh, sometimes, though, I'm sure as you know, or maybe you don't, but... Um, with basswood, um, when you spray it the first time, the grain actually rises like, you know, like your hair on your arm when you're scared. So it rises and then, of course, it dries just like that because, you know, the polyurethane freezes it in place. So um, you have to sand all of that off. So, you know, you can't get everywhere, but you kind of got to sand it all off. And then you hit it again with the with the polyurethane finish. Yeah, Olga, I totally agree with you. The <laughs> I totally agree with you. You know, I have a bunch of other tools and I tend to use those tools. I mean, my years have gotten quite high, so I have a lot of tools. But I would really love to see some tools like this, you know, like this sort of super tiny V tool or, you know, even better yet would be like, you know, I use the, I use the, um, the skew chisel all the time. I mean, all the time. So a tiny skew chisel would be really, really helpful for me if Shaft were to make some of those. So yeah, I mean, you can't just narrow it down to one tool. I kind of need what I have right now in detail size. <laughs> I totally agree. So, John, you're talking about the color of the smaller carving, correct? I'm pretty sure. I mean, there's no other color here, so I'm sure that's what you're talking about. Um, these colors are acrylic paints, and I have a giant bucket. So, you know, when I run across one that I need more of, I go and buy more, and you can't buy one usually. So I end up with this giant bucket of acrylic paints. And... What I can do, if you guys want, is I can talk to Bear again when I get this guy closer to finished. 
and then I can do another video of how I would paint it if you like. Would that be satisfactory? Okay, cool. Then I'll do that. This guy is just a repeat of this with slightly different angles, so I can get this guy pretty complete. However, there are a couple things I wanted to teach on this, so what I might do is um, maybe two more videos for this guy or a long one like today uh, of this guy because there's textures on the books that I wouldn't have been able to teach you otherwise if we just go to color. So maybe I can get this guy right up to the doorstep of the textures, and then we can go over a little more um, uh, work on the carving, and then we can color it right away. Maybe we can do something like that. I can, I'm sure I can arrange something. So I've heard it's hard to find basswood. Sure thing, John, no problem. I've sure I've heard it's hard to find basswood in certain states. Um, how is it for you guys in Texas? Is it hard for you guys to find? Or Florida? Or Ohio? I've seen a lot of you guys today. For me, all I gotta do is go down to the lumber yard and I can pick up, you know, 10, 10 foot planks of basswood. Cool, Carol. I'll definitely set something up then. On on the next one, I will do some textures of how the leather book would be, how I got the leather books to look like this, and how the table was done. I think you guys pretty much figured that out. I just cut in the lines. But part of the color process helps you understand how to get lines where your mind doesn't even know. It's just right. It's just normal for you guys to see darkness there and there and there but to use some of the colors to help your mind define that is really helpful i found cool so I'm going to end this live feed in about, you know, five minutes or so. I just wanted to make sure I got the main questions taken care of with you guys. So if you got any more, let me know. Oh, no kidding, Alfred. Yeah, Alfred, if you're in California, just go to a lumber yard. Uh, but I'm assuming you got you are from a different place. Cool, Joe. I'm glad you liked it. I'll try to do more in the future. Pick a different topic. Maybe we can do, I don't know, a dragon or something. Or anything. A, a pot, a pencil. <laughs> Whatever you guys want. But <clears throat> be happy to take care of that for you guys. I like stuff that sits on angles. It gives me the most understanding of 3D elements that I like to carve. So... It'll probably be something like that, at least.
Carol, you got a good question there. Um, well, well, I usually just use basswood. And in some cases, I will use birch, butternut, or gelatung. Except gelatung is very difficult to find on the West Coast. So, um, gelatung is absolutely fantastic for carving, machining, and it's really perfect for signs like, you know, the baker or, you know, the Smith family or whatever. They're fantastic. Um, for carving, I would say that, you know, basswood is the best, but that's because I can get basswood without any issue here in California. If I were in a place where I couldn't get it, I might have a completely different answer. Um, with butternut and with birch, I've also used those in the past as well. But birch is extremely heavy. It is really dense, so it's super easy to crack and it's super easy to chip. So I did a mermaid that was just massive. It was so big. By the time it got to the customer, it had snapped in half. So I'm real careful with birch now. So mainly for carving, I tend to use basswood. It just fits all the criteria that I need to get things finished. And if you guys have you know, been on my website or if you've been to the wood carving for beginners album section, you can see all the work I've done. And, you know, they're wide and varied in anywhere from a dragon to cats and flowers and you know sea creatures so it's all the way across the board and none of them have cracked over time um well good question for that carol i would assume that since i don't know i'm not going to answer meaning i'm not going to give you some crap answer if you went to a woodworking group I think they would have a better answer for you. I've never used it. It's cheap, but uh, at least in California, it's cheap to get. Um, poplar, uh, pine, there's a lot of different ones that I just haven't used before. Um, hardwood would be best. Not heavy would be best. Not super hard to cut into would be best. Uh, yeah, I just don't know enough about poplar to give you an accurate, clear answer. Is that right, Alfred? I don't remember. Oh, yeah, I did. That mermaid carving I did had a lot of pyrography, and it was fantastic for that. You're right. Really good work for that. Okay, guys, I'm going to call it. I really appreciate you guys coming in and watching um, be happy to do another one of these. Let me ask the powers that be and see if I'm allowed to do that, okay? Okay, guys, thanks a lot. Thanks for coming. We'll talk to you again in the future soon. Okay. Bye. You're welcome.